So first of all, I would like to say a warm welcome to everyone. And uh, on behalf of Eurocadres, this is, I thought that we should start today's proceeding with watching a very short little campaign video that we are launching from Eurocadres. More than half of all working days lost in the EU can be linked to work-related stress. The financial losses are astronomical. In Europe, only the cost for depression due to work is estimated at a staggering 617 billion euros. That's almost four times the whole annual EU budget. Stress has become an epidemic. We spend a large part of our lives working, and work should not make us ill. It is time for new EU legislation that deals with stress, work organization and harassment. It is time to end stress in the EU. When Eurocadres decided to move ahead with the launch of a campaign, this was uh, already a couple of years ago now, uh, we started the discussions early with the ETUC as we saw that this is something that we from the trade union family have to do jointly. Uh, the background for this, for Eurocadres part, is out of the refit review, the regulatory fitness checks that the Commission are running from time to time. Uh, that was going on a couple of years ago on uh, all the uh, directives relating to occupational health and safety. And from Eurocadre's side there, our intervention was that in the framework directive on occupational safety and health, we need to have more specific provisions on psychosocial risks to really deal with what we could see was already the formation of a stress epidemic in the EU. We were not listened to. And well, today I can say that maybe that wasn't the worst thing that could have happened, because I think that what we are launching today is a better solution. We don't need additional detail in the framework directive. The framework directive already covers psychosocial risks. I mean, if we would have put just another couple of mentions in there, would not really have changed much at all. What needs to happen is that we need to have on the national level, on the member state level, we need to have specific provisions on psychosocial risks on work organization, on workload assessment, etc. And that does not come out of the framework directive. That comes out of dedicated directive. And this is already the case for many of the other issues that are today dealt with through specific directives. So the reason for why Eurocadres is uh, choosing this form of organizing uh, this campaign is because of our, I would say, rather immense su success with the work on whistleblower protection that we've been doing the past few years. Uh, some three, four years ago, we started working intensely on it. And uh, when we started uh, the platform whistleblowerprotection.eu, the Commission was saying there's not even a legal basis that can be the foundation of a directive that will protect whistleblowers. On the 17th of December last year, we finally had a directive on whistleblower protection take effect. And that is, I would say, that's historical that we managed to get there so fast. And we did this by working hand in hand with the, the parliament. And we worked, the, we, we got there also by working hand in hand, the trade union movement and NGO movement. And this is the model also for what we are doing here today, launching the End Stress EU. This platform will be the vessel of cooperation uh, in civil society between trade unions and NGOs. And it will also be the platform where we can communicate directly with the European Parliament. Uh, as we are already a little bit behind in the schedule, I would like to cut it a bit short there and um, I would like to hand over the microphone to uh, Per Hilmersson, Pelle Hilmersson, which is the Deputy General Secretary of the ETUC and who is also in charge of uh, the occupational health and safety questions from there. Pelle, you have the floor. Thank you, Martin. You hear me okay? 
Good. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Martin said, I'm the Deputy General Secretary of the European Trade Union Confederation, the E2C. And we represent 45 million workers in Europe. And we are very happy to launch this uh, platform together with Eurocadres and other organizations calling for an EU directive to end work-related stress. Since the start of the current mandate of the European Commission and the European Parliament, the EGC has been calling on the EU institutions to take the lead and be ambitious in the field of occupational safety and health in general. During the last mandate, important work was done in relation to work-related cancers. And this work needs to, be, to continue, of course, during this mandate. But there's also a need a strong need to focus on EU policies that aim at better prevention of stress, so stress prevention. The ETC has insisted uh, since over a year on the European Commission to adopt a new EU health and safety at work strategy as the current one expires this year. We wanted to address the major causes of work-related diseases such as cancer, mutagens and reprotoxic substances, ergonomics, but also psychosocial risks. And it should be based on the principle of elim eliminating the hazard. And we really welcome the commitment made by the EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen to deliver on such a strategy next year. But there is a need for a more specific and legally binding action and measure on work-related stress. It had already become a, an epidemic before the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, accounting for more than half of all working days lost in the EU, but working from home during confinement has created new, pre new pressures that have negatively impacted on people's mental health. And since the lockdown, studies show that stress levels in Europe have risen substantially. New Eurostat data shows that one in three workers are always or often working under time pressure, a major cause of stress. From home, like over 48 hours and more likely to suffer repeatedly interrupted sleep. This is not only a problem for the individual worker, it's also a huge cost for companies and, and states. The cost of a depression due to work is estimated at over 600 billion euros per year. The EU framework directive from 1989 is not delivering in terms of psychosocial risks. We are calling on a new dedicated EU directive uh, on stress, um, psychosocial risk, or whatever you want to call it. The main thing is that the EU help member states and employers to end stress at work. And this is why the EGC, together with your cadres, uh, European Trade Union Federations, national trade unions and NGOs are launching this platform, this campaign. It's needed more than ever amid a mental health crisis worsened by the lockdown due to COVID-19. The campaign is led by the EQC and EU cadres, and it's supported by the Mental Health Europe as well as over 20 national, national trade unions. And I'm very happy that MEPs from the SD and Green groups in the European Parliament are also taking part in the campaign launch. I'm looking forward to the discussions today, and I hope the launch of the platform will contribute to put this important issue high, high on the EU agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Pelle. So now we have the pleasure to join us also Marianne Schapman from the European Trade Union Institute. And you have been given the very delightful headline of fact on figures on stress in the EU. I don't think I could have set a more boring title for you. But I, I hope that you will at least be able to give us some food for thought on this very pressing issue. Uh, Marianne, I think that you should be able to also share your screen for the presentation. And if not, then we can make sure to share it from our side. Great. Well, uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Martin, uh, for uh, inviting me to this uh, very important uh, uh, launch of this very important platform. It's uh, 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 from our side, from ETUI side, we couldn't agree more that this uh, issue needs, uh, needs attention and needs proper attention. And uh, I really um, gain hope from your, um, uh, the promising um, uh, 
uh, fact that, that you bring that you have uh, uh, reached a directive in another field so that you actually uh, 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 reached uh, the aim of, uh, of a directive. Because uh, in the field of uh, uh, psychosocial risks at work, it is probably not going to be easy. But uh, that uh, should withhold us from, uh, from going on with, um, with uh, fighting for it. Um, Work-related psychosocial risks and their consequences towards an understanding of the problem and um, and its remedies. I'm going to put myself somewhere else in the screen. So uh, I was asked indeed, uh, Martin, to, uh, to give facts and figures. And we discussed this in the, in the last couple of uh, months and weeks. And um, to be honest, facts and figures on work-related psychosocial risks in the EU are poor. And um, uh, so I will mainly, mainly do something else. I will show uh, uh, the main uh, or the best uh, figures we have, but it's not what we should, uh, um, we should aim at. We should aim at an understanding of the problem as an OSH problem. So that will be my second part of the presentation. And um, then I will go into more detail. And these are facts as well, but they are a different kind of facts than just the figures, the per percentages. And I will close uh, with the, uh, the question whether or not we need better facts and figures and how to get there. Um, so when I was asked uh, to present facts and figures, one of my uh, colleagues uh, uh, has, uh, has helped me with this because uh, this is something I cannot make myself. And um, uh, this, is, uh, this is an abstract from three reports, three ESSENER reports from the EU uh, Agency for Occupational Safety and Health in Bilbao. And they uh, do a survey every, uh, let's say, five years, and, uh, and they, they take stock of a few psychosocial risks. And you can see, well, what, what comes out of that. Job insecurity seems to go down. Poor communication at work went down and is going up again. Long or irregular work hours are there, but stable at a 20% uh, uh, level. Then you have time pressure. It's, it went down and it goes up again. And the thing that is really, really going up and is also really, really very present is difficult customer patients and pupils. Then we have also made um, uh, an overview of the measures to prevent psychosocial risks. And there you see measures taken on conflicts, measures taken on long and irregular hours, measures taken on work-related stress, measures taken on bullying or harassment, measures taken on threats, abuse or assaults by clients, and Ex measures taken on excessive job demands and work pressure. And there we are. So um, I'm going to close uh, this uh, presenting of, uh, of these figures because actually I'm not quite sure whether they say much. And that is because they are not based they seem not to be based on a real understanding of the issue at stake. Certain issues are being questioned in a questionnaire and, uh, and, and uh, information has been collected. But I think what is more important is that we realize the, what problem are we dealing with? What, is the, uh, what are the characteristics of this problem? And there I want to, I want to take you on a journey and I want to I want to, and it's very easy, stating the obvious, work-related psychosocial risks are risk related to the content and the organization of work and not a matter of sensitivity, resilience of the individual. Um, so 
work-related psychosocial risks are a normal, are, are just uh, an occupational risks, risk like any other risk, like uh, the risk of uh, uh, dangerous substances or the risk of, of uh, lifting heavy loads or the, the risk of rep rep repetitive movements. It is a work-related risk. So the risks are in the work situation and not in the individual. And for me, this is so obvious, but uh, uh, it's uh, uh, on every table that I, uh, that I am uh, about psychosocial risks, it's always about individual sensitivity and, and uh, uh, lifting up the resilience of the individual. This is really strange because if we speak about occupational cancer, we don't speak about uh, lifting up the resilience of the individual against uh, carcinogen substances. We don't, we, we try to control the exposure to uh, carcinogen, carcinogenous substances. So the same needs to be done here. We need to diminish the exposure to psychosocial risks. So the problem is in the content and the organization of the work. So there is also the solution. Then what I want to do with you is to bring some clarity about what we are talking about. The word stress to me is a bit puzzling. I would rather suggest to speak about risks, psychosocial risks in the content and the organization of the work. These risks have certain consequences for the individual, for many individuals, let's say. These consequences are uh, stress disorders. So work-related stress disorders. So these work-related stress disorders are occupational diseases. So on the one hand, we have risks in, uh, in occupations, in work, and we have consequences, and these are diseases. And there is a causal relation between them. And there now we come to the facts. Because um, there are indeed, there is research done on uh, the causal relation between psychosocial risks and certain consequences. The main work-related uh, uh, mental disorder is burnout. It's a very important one. I, uh, so um, one of the figures um, I got from my colleague is that 10.6% of workers in the EU are burnt out. It seems um, to me, actually, it seems to a too low a figure but uh, yeah, well, it dates back to 2015. It shows that we don't have many figures uh, uh, at present. The World Health Organization, however, has classified burnout as an occupational phenomenon. And that is quite, um, it's a, uh, a breakthrough, let's say. Burnout is the main one. Other work-related mental disorders are depression, work-related depression and work-related post-traumatic stress disorder. And there are some others and I leave them aside. So we start with, um, um, just a second. We start with psychosocial risks in the workplace that can cause burnout and the evidence for, co uh, for causal relations between the risks and the burnout. Um, so again, I want to stress that I speak about the workplace. We speak about work-related psychosocial risks. Um, and um, there has been research and there has been, there is evidence for the following elements that are important uh, for the coming into existence of work-related burnout. If uh, a job has a uh, an imbalance between effort, effort and reward, it can, it can uh, contribute to a burnout. And what do we have to think about then? It's physical, uh, it's physical effort, it's psychological effort, it's also um, time pressure. And if we speak about reward, it's not only about financial reward, but it's also being respected, being, being supported. Reward is also job security. It's also development of your own opportunities. So the possibilities to, for promotion, for, uh, uh, for status uh, security. The second element is high psychological job demands. 
like uh, high time pressure, high work speed, difficult and mentally strenuous work. Low decision autonomy. So if you don't have any control or very little control over your own task, uh, and you don't have the possibility to influence the stressors yourself, you can, uh, uh, you can end up in a burnout. Low decision autonomy is another, is another one. Low co-worker support and low supervisor support is also really important uh, uh, in, the, in, in the development of a, a work-related burnout. Low procedural justice. Are the formal procedures for decision-making in an organization being perceived as just? It's a really important factor. Low, re low relational justice, an other element that contributes to burnout, mainly about the relation with, this, with, the, the, with your superior. Is my superior honest? Is my superior impartial? Does he treat us or she treat us equally, fair? And then um, finally, high emotional demands. And it turns out uh, that, that is about uh, emotionally heavy work, work that demands a strong personal commitment. And um, it turns out to be mainly a problem for the male worker. Psychosocial risks in the workplace that can cause depression. Again, a list of um, a list of factors that um, contribute to a work-related depression, where we found evidence that uh, that this contributes to uh, to a depression. A bad fit, and I'm not going to into much detail here, but uh, just mentioning bad fit of the worker and the work. If the work is not fit for you if you or if you don't have clarity about your role or your responsibilities the expectations that are uh, uh, on the job it's uh, it can cause depression too much work workload as well low control on the work speed and the content of the work clearly also relational problems at work and lack of social support again the supervisor that uh, that supports you, the colleagues that support you, and there we have a new element uh, here that's um, it, I did not mention yet uh, for the burnout. It's bullying and other stressful experiences at work, and uh, of course combined with other elements of uh, of the list like lack of social su support, uh, it uh, it can uh, it's clear that it can lead to a depression, and then high psychological job demands. Finally, well, at least uh, not finally, but uh, in the third, uh, the third uh, uh, stress-related uh, disorder that I uh, want to discuss with you, and that is uh, related to psychosocial risks in the workplace, is uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And here we speak, of course, about something else. It's uh, it's it's just one single cause traumatic experience at work and it doesn't I mean it's not necessarily just only one traumatic experience often many traumatic experiences uh, come after another and at a certain moment uh, a person is uh, is done with it and uh, and breaks down and here we have to be careful what is a traumatic experience at work it's not any experience that is nasty or bad or, or whatever it is really an incident that involves severe uh, things like death or the, the threat of death or a threat of the physical integrity of the person, for example, rape. And this experience can be direct concerning the worker, him or herself, or indirect, the worker being the witness of the incident. And here, I think I can go back to one of the figures uh, shown in the, in, in the first slides. I think a relevant figure here is uh, that 59.7% uh, of the workers in the EU experience difficult customers, patients, and pu pupils. Of course, this is, uh, the, and, and, and this here, I, of course, I refer to aggression, aggression as a, as a traumatic experience. Severe aggression uh, can, uh, can definitely and, and also does lead to uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. 
So what about the timing? Do we have, uh, uh, how are we in the time, uh, Martin? Sorry, I didn't. Uh... We are uh, a little bit late, but uh, not a whole lot. Six minutes, we should have started with the, the panel. Okay. So if you, I could give you five more minutes. Okay. Okay. So um, I just want to give, I, 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 I will then just give one example of a worker uh, that uh, uh, developed a burnout, Anna. Uh, she's a planner in a factory uh, and uh, it's a new plant in the, in the Netherlands, a new establishment, and uh, she's responsible for purchase, production, transport, stock management and mentoring other colleagues. Um, it was a new plant, it had all had to be uh, uh, built up. So she worked hard, she worked 50 hours and at a, at a certain point, even 60 to 70 hours a week. But she thought it's only temporary. It's, it's just a matter of starting up and then things will work out. Uh, sometimes the bosses came in the factory and she, she complained about certain elements of her work that uh, things were not well organized and, but the management did nothing. So she kept on working. Um, she had the advantage that she could log in from home and she worked evenings and weekends because at work she was being uh, disturbed all the time by colleagues because she was responsible for so many tasks. Um, after one year, two colleagues left. They were uh, so and they were replaced, but they were replaced by temporary workers. She worked even harder. So no relaxing. She got eat and sleeping problems. Then a new computer system was uh, uh, implemented, so she could not log in from home anymore. On the one hand, of course, this is, uh, this is an advantage, but the computer system also gave many, many other implementation problems. It was a disaster. The temporary colleagues did not perform the job as they should. And the, at the end of the day, at the end of uh, one and a half year, the only moments of rest uh, Anna had were 25 minutes in her car towards the job and back home. So, um, of course, this ended up uh, in a disaster. At a certain moment, Anna arrived at her uh, at the factory, and she did. She just did not remember how she got there. So she there it uh, 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 she developed a burnout. Well, here we see, and I don't need to, I don't need to elaborate on that. I think we we do see here a lot of the elements that I discussed. Um, uh, for the burnout, uh, for the development of the burnout, uh, as 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 uh, as as elements, factors that cause a burnout. It's just one example. I skip the other one, and this is my final slide. Um, we don't have many facts and figures on um, psychosocial risks at work, but if we are going to collect them. Uh, facts, either qualitative or quantitative, it needs to be based on a proper understanding of the problem we want to picture and understand. So, and the problem is that we are being exposed to work-related psychosocial risks. This is a work problem. It's a problem in the work, not in the individual worker. These This exposure has consequences in terms of mental occupational diseases and there is a causal relation between them. And if we don't get into depth on that topic, uh, we won't get any better figures because uh, we, we just get random figures that don't give us the, the understanding of the problem. So at this basis, we can regulate the exposure to the risks as we do in all other fields of OSH and not stick to blaming the victim and, and strengthen his or her resilience for psychosocial risk. We don't do that for other physical risks either. And I'm sure I know that one of the next speakers will go into the clear possibilities for regulation that occur at the basis of a proper understanding of the problem. So that was it for today. Thank you very much for your attention and happy to answer any questions and participate in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Marian. And for everyone's information, I can also say that we have indeed added Marian to the um, to the panel. 
that follows uh, this part. Now we were supposed to listen to uh, an MEP. We're going to listen to an MEP soon, but we're going to listen to another one first because we're supposed to have here today with us Alex Agio Saliba, who is a Maltese MEP for Socialist Democrats. Unfortunately, he had to cancel his participation in our event, uh, but he has been so kind as to send us a uh, video message instead. First of all, good afternoon. And I would like to apologize for not being able to be with you today. And I really hope that you, your families, your friends and your loved ones are in good health in these challenging times of the COVID-19 crisis. Secondly, I would like to congr congratulate Eurocadres and also ETUC on launching this important and also very timely initiative, Enstress.eu, in order to tackle the stress epidemic aiming to address psychological, psychological risks, violence, harassment, and also improve our working conditions. The COVID-19 pandemic has put additional strain on the mental health of workers, and now, more than ever, it is the right time to have proper legislation, which improves the mental health situation at work throughout Europe. It is clear. It is clear that policy and practical solutions will need to be identified and addressed in order to ensure that mental health problems are better diagnosed, better managed and also better treated. Therefore, to address mental health issues, we need a holistic approach across our communities, across our society as a whole. For example, in the field of employment, the workplace can be a cause as well as also a support for mental health. As a member of the Employment Committee and also as a rapporteur on the right to disconnect, I firmly believe that we should focus more on prevention of mental health issues. Prevention is key. Putting pressure on employees to be always available has detrimental impacts on the mental health and complicates the achievement of the fundamental rights of health and safety as well as working time limitations, remuneration and compensation. In the field of employment, the right to disconnect is definitely a major step towards substantial improvements in the balance of work life and family life, therefore directly contributing positively also to the better mental health of our EU workers. Let me explain to you why do we need urgently a directive on the right to disconnect. First of all, the expectations on workers that they are basically reachable and available at any time and from anywhere are always on the rise. This is definitely affecting workers' fundamental rights and their physical and mental health and well-being, as well as their work-life balance. Secondly, in these particular times that we are living in the COVID-19 crisis, it has become even more urgent to ensure that workers are able to exercise their right to disconnect. Thirdly, the digital tools for work purposes should be used properly and should be used efficiently, with care to avoid any infringement of workers' rights to fair working conditions, including fair remuneration, the limitation of working time and also work-life balance, as well as health and safety at our workplaces. I also believe that workers should not have to be afraid to suffer any negative repercussions because they refrain from engaging in work-related tasks, activities, electronic communications such as phone calls, emails, uh, and also messages outside their working time. I also believe that employers should not require workers to be directly or also indirectly be available and reachable outside their working time and should provide workers with sufficient information setting out their workers' right to disconnect. It will defeat its purpose to have the right to disconnect if basically workers will not be able and are not aware of this fundamental right. Last but not least, social partners are instrumental for the effective implementation and enforcement of the right to disconnect. I believe that the best way is to do this at national level through collective agreements, taking into account the different realities, particularities, and also the different industries and the different national legislations and also rules. 
It is therefore instrumental in helping to safeguard employment during the COVID-19 crisis. Coronavirus could append traditional work weeks and working hours as we know it. More than ever, we need the right to disconnect, which has become instrumental to ensure appropriate safeguards at union level, a minimum level of protection of workers in the new digital era, and also in the aftermath of the COVID crisis. Thank you. So let's see, we have a new person joining us and that is Alvina Alametze from the Greens EFA in the European Parliament. Uh, we had the uh, we had the occasion to meet uh, uh, meet Alvina actually before she became an MEP, MEP because we have met each other in um, one in all these different events on on psychosocial risks and mental health that has been going on here. So we were very happy to find out that Alvina would be joining the Parliament to take on this struggle also from within the EU institution. Um, as regards the Greens, the Greens were actually um, so good as to take our call for a directive to combat work-related stress into their election manifesto. So I would like to ask uh, Alvina Alametze to kick off our panel here today. Alvina, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Martin, and all the others for inviting me here. It's a pleasure. And thank you all for the very important campaign. As, as Martin said, I have been working for Better Mental Health Services for, for quite a while, quite many years before starting as MAP. Uh, now I'm really taking this new role seriously to try to take things even further from my side. And I do think that we definitely need new EU legislation to fight the stress epidemic. This is my honest opinion. Stress and psychosocial risks at work are a very important issue in many levels. Workers' rights, people's mental health, well-being and happiness, and European economy. As you know, more, more than half of all lost working days in EU are caused by work-related stress. And this stress itself can predispose people to other mental health problems and issues like depression. And these costs for work-related depression alone in the European Union area are over 600 billion euros per year, or more than 4% of the GDP. So it is vast numbers we are talking about here. So every MAP who is worried about the European economy should be worried about mental health and act on it. This is my, my thinking. And as a policymaker and a former mental health advocate and activist, I really think that it's important that we gather a large number of different stakeholders behind this campaign. And I feel that this is achievable because um, most, if not all, important stakeholders have something to gain from more sustainable working environment uh, in terms of mental health. I think it both saves resources in public and private sectors and helps people. And for example, here in Finland, we have pushed for better mental health services with a legal initiative on guaranteed access to psychotherapy and immediately when people seek help. So within one month when they see a doctor and seek help for psychosocial issues, they should have this treatment. And this benefits all. And I also initiated uh, two uh, of these low threshold clinics here in Helsinki, where one can just walk in to get professional psychosocial treatment immediately and for free with no cost whatsoever. And this idea came when my friend tried to seek help for many, 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 many months and had no success. And it was all really complicated. It was really hard for us to find the right place and right time to treat him. him. And I think that getting help should never be as difficult, especially for a person who already had suicidal thoughts. And this is our responsibility to fix. Trade unions around Europe and uh, all, all of you members have successfully lobbied for better job security since the Industrial Revolution. 
And protecting workers from psychosocial risks, I think, should be seen as a clear continuation of this work. And businesses and employers should also see this as an opportunity. As has been proven by multiple examples, improving psychosocial psychological well-being of employees usually increases business outcomes uh, by reducing sick days and promoting better cooperation and productivity. And as managers say, uh, nearly 80% of the European managers are concerned about problems with stress in their establishment. So 80%, that is a huge amount of people and establishments. So this is a big, big problem also in the workplaces. And we have a lot of scientific research on this. And uh, the NGOs and social movements also should be given the opportunity to lend their collective intelligence they have towards this policy making, showing the different perspectives and giving the voice to the people who will be affected by these new policies, by this conversation. So these people with lived experience should be heard in this process. Today, my colleague Alex was uh, supposed to be here, but uh, he gave us the video presentation and he has been instrumental in promoting right to disconnect in the European Parliament. And I think this is a really timely thing to discuss here in the end. The rising expectation that workers are reachable at any time, at any hour, does ne negatively affect the fundamental rights of workers. And personally, I have also been in the situation where my boss has called me at 2 a.m. in the morning to ask for something or uh, just assume that I will be working until, well, very late in the evening and, and so on. And I think that a lot of us have experienced this kind of uh, situation. According to research, especially younger professionals often feel that they have to be available at all hours and many don't even count things like checking email in the evening as official working hours and not being able to disconnect leads to unpaid work, more stress and worse mental health as we have heard today. So I think that we need to act on this and actually we are going to have a report on this issue that is currently being considered in the Committee of Employment. And I think the parliament should also create a new directive on the matter. This is what we need now. There is yet no specific union-wide law on the workers' right to disconnect from digital tools. So it is very important and this is the next step we have to take. So last but not least, I would like to say that the EU and member states National and regional government should be including the promotion of good mental health and management of psychosocial risks in all labor and workforce related policies and initiatives. So this should always be considered in the same way that we consider physical risks. We have to consider the psychological risks. And this includes the accessible mental health services, combating the workplace bullying, which Marianne referred to very well earlier on, integrating people with mental health issues to workforce better, and having obligatory psychosocial risk assessments, standards and prevention strategies for employers. And in most places, it is actually already mandatory to have risk assessment and prevention strategies for physical harm. Like if you are working at the construction site, you must uh, provide your workers with helmets for their head. And then uh, suddenly if they move to office, then they are not provided a helmet like this for stress and all the other factors that are actually dangerous for your mental health and well-being. So we also need the psychological helmet for people. And this is something EU should work with and help the people with. I think that this is something that we now need to push forward. This is the right time and the right place and we have all the great people here to support this cause. I deeply thank you for this important work and hope to continue the discussion. Thank you very much, Alvina, for that message. Um, I would like to hand over the floor now to Nina Hedegaard Nielsen, who is a senior policy advisor with um, the Danish Trade Union Confederation working on occupational health and safety and also being the 
the workers' representative in the EU OSHA tripartite bodies, the, the board, I think it's called, correct me if I'm wrong there, Nina. Nina, you may have the floor. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Martin. Uh, it's actually the, the commission's uh, advisory committee for health and safety, where I'm the spokesperson. But I'm also a member of the board in, in OSHA. But yeah, but, but thanks a lot. And, and uh, thank you for inviting me to also be a panelist at this uh, really important launch. Uh, and uh, with the headline saying what for the panel, the headline was, do we need new EU legislation to fight the stress epidemic? And I would say my clear answer is yes. And both Alvina and Alex has talked a lot about a directive on the right to disconnect. I think that is, that is one important part but we also need a directive that deals more directly with the, uh, with the risk factors in the psychosocial working environment in the workplace when the work is actually happening. Let me give you an example. For example, if you work in a hospital as a nurse, the main problem is not the right to disconnect when you're, when you're at home. The main problem is what happens in the work hours. So, so the right to disconnect is, is one element that we definitely need, but we also need a directive uh, on psychosocial risks in itself. And, and uh, I think there are two important questions you need to, to answer when, when you say that. And the first question is, of course, why? Uh, and uh, Marian has already said what the problem is and, 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 and what the consequences are. So I'm not going to go into more, uh, more into that. I'm going to go into why the current legislation is not good enough today. Um, and I think that's, that's quite fairly clear, uh, clear that we are dealing with uh, a uh, framework directive from 1989, like you said, Martin, and a lot of things have happened in the world of work since then. It's not that we didn't have some problems then, but they've just been growing since. Um, and the problem is obvious. Psychosocial risks are not mentioned, not even once in the legislations. So that means there's no mentioning of violence, sexual harassment, bullying, time pressure, workload, work organization, emotional demands, and all those concepts and all the important risk factors in the psychosocial working environment, they're not even one of them is mentioned in EU legislation today. So to put this into perspective, we actually have 21 individual directives on the, on the physical hazards or, or on the physical side of things, 11 of them being on specific hazards. That means, for example, noise, noise, carcinogens, chemical agents, biological agents. So we have 11, but none of them deals with psychosocial risk factors. So that, I think, is a major inequality between the prevention we expect and also not to forget that we enforce in the member states in the physical work environment compared to the psychosocial work environment. So, and we also have a major gender problem here since women are often more exposed to psychosocial risk than men. So what women are more exposed to is actually not properly regulated. And finally, dealing with the why, we also have a problem with not having a level playing field in the EU. And that is something we, uh, when we speak about us legislation, the level playing field is at the core, it's at the center of why we have the us legislation in the EU. So here we have member states making provisions, dealing more details, enforcing this area, and member states actually not doing much in this field. So, so we need a level playing field. That's also to the core of why. So that was, that was, that was my brief answer of why we need this. Uh, then the second important question, that is, can it be done? And will it actually work? And first of all, as I think it's important to turn this question the other way around. And, and I think Mayan already said it, but I'm going to elaborate a little bit on that. Because what we often hear is you cannot regulate stress and mental health. It's far too individual and personal. I even heard Commissioner Smith saying this when he, uh, when he just had his first speech uh, being the new commissioner. So to, 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 to look at this question, I think we should look at how we set EU limit values for dangerous chemical substances. Because when we do that, we use risk estimates and a risk estimate will tell you how many workers uh, we expect will get cancer from exposure to a certain carcinogen, for example. So usually one example is we estimate that one in 1,000, one per worker in 1,000 will get cancer being exposed to a carcinogen at work in a certain concentration. And here comes my point. 
it is not all workers exposed to this carcinogen that will get the cancer. It's actually just one worker in 1000, which I must stress, of course, is one too many. We're not, that's not the point. The point is it's just one in 1000. So why is it that we usually say when a worker gets stressed at work or has some mental health problem, it has to do with that person's personality or private life? Uh, and why don't we say that when a worker gets cancer, it has to do with the worker's uh, genetic makeup? So why do we blame the worker when it has to do with the psyche? So that, so that is the main problem. Why do we blame the worker? Why do we say because your colleague didn't get stressed, but you do, then it's you that has a problem. That's what we usually say when it comes to psychosocial risks. So the way we deal with the chemical substances is actually the way we should also deal with psychosocial risks. We need to limit the exposure to the hazards. Um, and we are dealing with the environment. We are dealing with regulating risk factors at the workplace, not in the individual. It's about organization of work and it's about social relations of work. So coming, coming back to the question, can it be done? Well, it has been done already. So that's always a good thing. Uh, we have Sweden, Denmark, Belgium, the Netherlands, and as far as I know, also Australia, just to take a country outside of the EU. Uh, just to mention some countries that was working with this. And the latest being, I'm proud to say, the new Danish ordinance with provisions on psychosocial risks that will come into in, in force on November 1st. So it's it's been published, but it's not into force yet. But the question is also, how does these provisions work? How do we think they actually work? So first of all, they create a common language about why people get stressed at work, what risk factors to prevent and how to do it. And I would like to illustrate this by uh, uh, telling you what the new Danish provision deals with. That deals with five risk factors. What, the first one being large workload and time pressure. The second one being unclear and conflicting demands. The third one being high emotional demands when working with people. The fourth one being offensive acts, including bullying and sexual harassment. And the fifth one being work-related violence. So that's the risk factors that it's dealing with. And when preventing workers from getting ill from these factors, the employers will also have to follow the prevention principle. And as many of you know, the prevention principles are at the core of all us legislation. And they mean that first and foremost, the employer has to limit the exposure. And to give you one example on how that is done when you speak about psychosocial risk, that will be if the problem is that the worker has too many complicated tasks and too little time to do the task and with no support, the solution is not fixing the worker by giving her mindfulness training. The solution is looking at how to organize the work, asking questions like, can somebody else take over some of the tasks? Do we need to hire more people? And provide the worker with proper support. That, that's the solution here. So we have to remember that this is a first step. Like I would say for the final thing, this legislation will not work as a magic wand. Uh, but it will lay a foundation on which to work from. It will focus the attention and it will begin the journey to an EU uh, with no stress. And it's important to remember also that we still have too many workers getting ill from work-related cancer, but we have a legal foundation in place here. And there's absolutely no doubt that that has made a huge difference. And we're constantly developing that. This is the same thing we have to do with psychosocial risk. We have to have that foundation uh, laid down and then we have to work from that and and that's the that's the step to to work from here so that was that was what i would like to say thank you thank you nina and now we come to the last speaker of the panel we will also have Pelle and marian in the panel but they have already spoken here so uh, I would like to give the floor to Laura Marchetti, who is the Senior Policy Officer of Mental Health Europe. Your director was supposed to be here, but unfortunately had to cancel today. But I'm very happy that you will stand in and replace us. I'm confident and sure, I'm sure that you will be doing a great job here. We have worked together already in uh, the platform European Mental Health Alliance Work and Employment. I think the long, lengthy title is... Yeah. Welcome. Thank you, Martin. Um, well, for the introduction and for inviting us. Um, indeed, uh, I wasn't supposed to be the, the speaker for my organization, but uh, still, you love me. 
Um, just to just to be, before starting, I'll, I'll I'll shorten a bit what I wanted to say, both for time reason, but also because I think I, I agree with the, everything that has been said until now. So I think it, it doesn't really necessarily make sense to repeat myself. For those of you that don't know Mental Health Europe, uh, we are uh, uh, an NGO, a non-governmental organization that represents uh, more than 70 members within uh, uh, 30 uh, member uh, within 30 European countries. So we have quite a wide uh, geographical range. We represent service mental health service providers, but also users. We represent mental health professionals, and in general, uh, people that have or had experienced mental health problems to their family and friends. So also our uh, membership as such is quite uh, diverse. Um, I, I think that my main message for this and with, the, with this, I would like to kind of link to what Nina was saying is that usually when you, when we talk about this topic, um, when it comes to mental health in general, but when it comes to mental health in the workplace in particular, there is often the counter argument that uh, this is a personal issue uh, and that this is a problem of the individual that maybe they are uh, not resilient enough or they are not shy, uh, uh, they are too shy and they are not um, enough um, confident in themselves. So they should just, you know, take some course on, on self-care or how to be more assertive and everything is going to be fine. Um, and our main message here is not not at all. <laughs> uh, that's that's not really the point. As um, Marian was showing in a, in her research and a, with her PowerPoint, when it comes to work related stress and psychosocial risk, we are talking about an imbalance um, that comes from the the harmful uh, relationship that there is between. Uh, the work that uh, the demand of work and the and the resources that are that an employee has to address and cope with this work. So it's not very much personal. We're here. We're talking about organization and structure of the work. So we're not talking about personalities. We're not talking about uh, a life story of a person and how uh, confident this person is. That we we are talking about the structure, um, and this is a very much a, a health and safety issue in the workplace. Um, and one of the reasons why I think uh, we, we tend not to look at it as at the same level as any other health and safety issue in the workplace um, is, is, is twofold. First of all, it's, it's about mental health and we tend to have uh, often misconception about mental health that comes also from the stigma that is behind it. Secondly, um, it might have also something to do with the fact that our current framework doesn't cover it uh, adequately. So in a way or another, we don't tend to see it on the same level uh, because we don't have um, adequate legislation that puts it at the same level as other health and safety risks that, um, that we have in the workplace. And this is for us at least another important reason why we, we need uh, better standards uh, and we need uh, a, a more collective European effort to address it, because otherwise it still is always going to remain an issue that is um, overlooked. Uh, while we have data that tell us that there are people that develop mental health problems in the workplace, if these mental health problems are not, um, they, they don't receive the, the right support, they can become more long-term and also translate into physical problems. And you were talking about job losses, productivity losses. It, it, it's way much bigger than just a person. Uh, and it's very much non-dependent on a person because in some circumstances, and uh, Marian again was, was giving some concrete examples of work-related stress and the psychosocial risk. This is not a, a personal issue. Um, this is a matter of, of, of the structure. So if a person doesn't have clarity overall, if a person um, that there isn't a good communication within within the structure, uh, there is no reward. Uh, it, it's not a person that is too sensitive. This is the the system that has to change. Uh, and um, yeah, and I think this is our our main uh, strong point that it's not. Um, it's not just a matter of, you know, building up a bit of resilience. Thank you, Laura. Very happy to hear this. 
the, this is indeed a, a, a message that we as, as trade unions are very happy to hear from you as an organization working on mental health. Um, it, it is indeed a problem which needs to be tackled on the organizational level. And that's what we do as trade unions dealing with occupational health and safety here. We are running quite late looking at the time. Uh, we have only 10 minutes left of the uh, panel discussion that was supposed to follow now. So it is not, uh, it's not going to be a very difficult task for me to do some moderation of this because all my questions, I will just not be able to ask you. <laughs> Um, so I would like to, first of all, instead open up the floor for comments from also Pelle and Marian. Uh, you did your intervention before, but also I think Alvina is still with us, although without the camera activated currently. So uh, please, if you would like to intervene and comment on each other's uh, presentations here, I would like to invite you to do that first of all. Are we being polite, Pella? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, well, uh, it, uh, it was a great uh, pleasure to listen uh, to the other uh, panelists. Really, really, really interesting and, uh, and um, uh, motivated and committed uh, 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 comments. And um, I think uh, one a clear line here and uh, and that is uh, that I don't meet that very often but the clear line is the problem is in the organization of the work in the structure as Laura called it in the system in uh, in in the collective in uh, in and in other words in our terms in prevention prevent uh, uh, prevent workers from psychosocial risks and this has to be done in the workplace then a, a short remark on the on the right uh, to disconnect and a directive on the uh, a directive on this issue indeed um, i think uh, it would be uh, a good thing if we get uh, a directive like that but it would not work without uh, regulating psychosocial risk in a more broader context um, because I can, we can get the right to disconnect and then stay in the same kind of work organization that we uh, that we are in now, and um, it it, uh, it it will be uh, it will be difficult to to uh, execute this right to disconnect to really say I am going to take this right to disconnect. So it the the, the and don't get me wrong because I'm really. Uh, I really realize the problem of uh, of this uh, being available all the time. Uh, actually, I, I I experience it as a manager. I do have uh, indeed, uh, uh, Alvina. I have younger colleagues that actually apologize if they don't react to my email within fifteen minutes, and you know, and then and. I might sometimes send an email in the evening and I don't expect my colleagues to react, but I get an, an enormous apology the next morning. Oh, I didn't see it. I hope I'm not too late. Da, 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 da. So I explicitly, explicitly tell them, please don't apologize if you don't react on, a, on an evening email. But it's indeed something that uh, young workers seem to find really normal. I have a daughter working also uh, in an environment that she needs to check her email at 11 o'clock in the evening because uh, otherwise her career will not uh, uh, flourish. So uh, it's really an important issue, but it will not work if we don't ch change the whole chain of problem, the whole context in which a problem like this can uh, come up. So, uh, and there um, it's, 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 um, it's really a matter of uh, being aware that something can be done. It's, uh, it's, it's not, uh, uh, as Nina also said uh, uh, very clearly, we can do it. It's, uh, uh, I know that Nina also has a lot of experience on the topic. Uh, uh, she can tell us a lot about the practicalities of it, but it can be done. We can organize uh, our work 
in a way that we support one another instead of only asking, asking, demanding, demanding, um, uh, neglecting, um, uh, uh, giving, um, uh, saying bad things to one another when something did, did, uh, went wrong instead of giving a compliment when something went right. Uh, uh, be aware of what your colleagues need, not only as a manager, but also uh, as, uh, as colleagues. And, uh, and indeed, uh, uh, there are many more things to say. I don't take all the time. So thank you. Thank you, Marian. I, I think I would like to actually put, the, put my first question to the panelists uh, directly to Alvina, as we now have an MEP among us. Uh, we heard in the video message in the beginning here from uh, from Alex Agir Saliba about the right to disconnect, and you also touched upon the topic in your introduction. Um, so my concrete question would be, right now, as the parliament is working on the own legislative initiative report on the right to disconnect, is, the, is it your assessment that there's really room for this call? And why would the right to disconnect not be enough in your view? Thank you, Martin, for the great question. And thank you, Laura, also for a great presentation uh, before this. Uh, I, I definitely think that there is room for this kind of directive and this kind of thinking. I think uh, we just have to see this as our modern time and understand that the working environments have really changed a lot. And especially many politicians are interested about what the trade unions say. And I think trade unions are now having, as we see, a lot more input on the area and really active work on it. And I, of course, think that there is a big stigma and taboo on mental health issues and topic among the parliamentarians. I have also had colleagues at the uh, European Parliament say that they don't have mental health issues in their countries and this is not an issue in their country. And I'm like, well, yeah, I don't really, I don't really think that's true. Uh, so uh, I think there is room, but we need to work for it a lot. Thank you. Yeah, indeed, we need to work on it. Um, so we only have a couple of minutes left here. I, I will I will go to Nina then. You mentioned briefly in the beginning here that you have been part of the work in Denmark on developing the new ordinance, I think it's called with you, uh, on psychosocial risks. And I, I'd like to hear from now, and you're a practitioner now really in, in this developing legislation now, what what were what was the choice of your focus in this? And do you think there's anything that we can learn on the European level uh, from your very recent experience as regards this? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Martin. I say our our focus was on on getting these the most important risk factors in the psychosocial working environment to get those down on paper. So it's completely clear to the employers and to the workplaces, what is it that you have to deal with? You have to deal with these risk factors. And there again, they come back to also Marion's presentation of what is it that makes people ill. Uh, as unions, we would have liked to have seen night work, night shift also being part of this and also shift work like they have in the Swedish ordinance, but that was something that we could not agree upon in Denmark, so we don't have it there. So, so it's not like we got everything, but we try to focus on the most important risk factors. So, so we got them in. So that's one thing. And the second one was also to focus on the prevention, that the prevention has to follow the prevention principles. So we put the prevention principles directly into the ordinance in an appendix, also together with uh, some, some highlights of what is proper prevention, whereas the first one is saying, this is the way you organize and plan work. That is number one. Number one is always how you organize and plan work like I gave an example before. So, so basically trying to, to build this common language on, on what is it that, what is psychosocial risk? We also put in a definition of what is psychosocial working environment, which I also think is quite important because that is one of the main problems that when people talk about this, they talk about mental health or they talk about psychosocial risk or they talk about stress or they talk about also the treatment or they talk about like you also do the MEPs, including people with mental health in the workplace, which is also an important issue, but it's just not this one. This one is about preventing that people get ill from work so, so if you cut the cake, 
that way. That's how we cut this cake. And then there are other cakes when you talk about mental health, but they're in a different place. So we try to do that to be feel really clear about what is this concept and how have to, how do you have to deal with it in the workplaces and what are your obligations as employer? So I, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you, it does. And I see also in the chat here to the panelists, we have received a comment from Kette at uh, from AC, the academics in Denmark. Maybe we should skip the expression psychological or psychosocial and instead call it social organization risk, highlighting that it's not a question of individual capacity and resilience. I think that's also very much in line with, with what uh, Laura mentioned before from Mental Health Europe that this is indeed not an individual issue that we need to tackle on the individual level, but instead a structural problem that needs to be addressed in a structured manner through the means of legislation. And we have actually, um, due to the somewhat difficult start here with the technology and uh, interpretation, I think in the end, we didn't manage to actually get interpretation into French. I think we managed Italian, but I hope that uh, our French colleagues were able to follow as, as well as possible, at least. Um, but I would like now to give the, uh, the floor to, to Pelle for the closing after uh, my final, then a little bit more practically oriented information to everyone. And I will now put it into the chat here. Um, because we are now today also launching the website, which you will find at endstress.eu. I don't know if this works as a link, but you will find it there. Uh, but you can also, uh, for signing up for the, um, for the platform as an organization, I would like to invite you to go to the following address. tinyurl.com and stress sign up. And then the final practical message is that in this platform, we are also run, occasionally running meetings and this will be particularly to keep up with um, which, com which communication we have within EU institutions. Um, that will be, um, uh, and there we also have an email list. So I would like to invite those of you that would like to participate on this list to send an email to the Eurocadre Secretariat. Secretariat at eurocadres.eu. And then we will email you uh, instructions for how you can join the Google, um, Google Groups list. So uh, from my side, I would like to uh, say a big thank you to all the participants uh, for your active participation and to also to all the attendees. We were supposed to open up also for some audience questions. We had the Q&A running, but yeah, we kept this a rather short event uh, to not take up too much of your afternoon time for this, but we will of course get busy with the campaign from this. But I would like to give the floor now over to Pelle Hilmerson for the closing and thank you to, uh, to Laura and Nina and Alvina and Marion from my side. Thank you, Martin. And I will be very brief. I have uh, uh, one minute, half a minute. Um, I would just like to conclude by stating the obvious, as Marianne Chapman said, that uh, occupational psychosocial risks are risks related to the content and the organizational work and not a matter of uh, in individual workers' sensitivity or resilience. I think this is clear. Uh, it's not the responsibility of, of the individual worker, but of the employer. So let's uh, help the employers by, uh, by an EU legislation uh, to reduce stress at work with clear and binding measures, because this makes economic sense as well for the employers. More than half of all working days lost in the EU are caused by work-related distress. And as we know, only a few member states have clear national legislation. Uh, uh, so we need to act at EU level. And the question we have tried to answer today is, is if we need such a legislation, and I think all participants have uh, answered yes to this, uh, we need to limit the exposure to stress uh, hazards. Uh, so it's time for the EU institutions, especially the European Commission to 
to show that they take this seriously. Um, of course, the next step for us for this platform is to develop our ideas discussed today on what the EU directive should contain more concretely. Uh, so please go to endstress.eu and join the platform if you haven't done so already and help us spreading the good word uh, so that more will join so we can together put strong pressure on the EU to act. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, and goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. More than half of all working days lost in the EU can be linked to work related stress. The financial losses are astronomical. In Europe, only the cost for depression due to work is estimated at a staggering 617 billion euros. That's almost four times the whole annual EU budget. Stress has become an epidemic. We spend a large part of our lives working, and work should not make us ill. It is time for new EU legislation that deals with stress, work organization and harassment. It is time to end stress in the EU.